I was taking a trip down memory lane the other day, looking at old programs from when I ran my gym in California, and I came across this one I wanted to share with you guys because it is a doozy. This program helped put on the order of 100 pounds on not one, but three different lifters squat in a 10-week period. Five-week program, I had them each run through it twice. So I wanted to share with you guys so you can see some of the principles at play here so you can help solve some of your own problems if you're up against a plateau or a wall or you're looking for ideas on how to get over this hump. And I also wanted to talk about the decision-making. I wanna talk about why I think it worked for these guys. And it just so happened that these three guys were three different uh, levels of advancement. We have Kevin, who was a late novice at 6'1", about 180 pounds. He missed a 285 squat his first day at the gym. Uh, Edward was an advanced strongman, a little stockier, competed in the 198 class, 5'8". 5'8's a little generous. I remember Edward being about 5'7". And uh, he went from low mid 500 pounds. I remember him distinctly repping 545 mid program for five to six reps that were pretty easy. He got to 585, but that was conservative. He was well over 600 pounds at that point. And then we have Roman, who was an intermediate athletic dude, 5'11", about 220 pounds, 18 to 20% body fat um, on the bigger side, uh, but he had a lot of potential and I really wanted to give him something to help his squat because he was really struggling with depth. I remember him hitting 405 on a few different occasions. He was a little bit of a leggier lifter and he just was not comfortable at the bottom. And he's one of my favorite stories to tell because he was a big West Side guy. He came to the gym for the first time, kind of preaching the good word of Louis Simmons. And the one thing that I saw that he was neglecting was consistency with this lift that he just wasn't comfortable with. So all of the rotation of exercises was not doing him any justice. Focusing on strain and band tension and, and rotation, he just needed some skill and to get comfortable where he sucked, which was at the bottom. So they all had different problems. Kevin as a late novice was a little thin. He was hard gainery and he had a little bit of, of size to put on. So I wanted to give him something that was going to put some mass on his frame. I thought he had about five to 10 pounds of gain in a pretty short period of time. And always with squatting, if somebody's struggling, one of my main go-tos is to look at are they getting enough repetition? Are they getting enough practice to be comfortable with the movement? So that means not going balls out. That means not just going as heavy as you can, as often as you can. That means accruing more work, especially when you're a little fatigued because that's when you can make yourself fight a little bit harder without necessarily having the weight be like near maximal. You can have reasonable amounts of weight, be a little more challenging, kind of push you out of position a little bit. So it's a good way to reinforce good habits without necessarily having to kill yourself with load. Um, you had Edward who as a strongman competitor really had to focus on the deadlift, but he was getting ready for a side handle deadlift contest, which is it benefits more from squatting than it does from deadlifting. A lot of good deadlifters try to go into that event and just deadlift it and they end up getting their clocks cleaned. So he had kind of a big gap, pretty good deadlift, but his squat needed to come up. And uh, then you have uh, Roman who just was not comfortable at the bottom of his squat. They all had different experience. They were all built a bit different and I think the program that I gave them, it worked as well as it did because it painted with a very broad brush. It addressed some of the most common things that people screw up when they're focusing on their squat. And I'd say they're lifting in general. Now, this isn't to sell you on the program. The program's absolutely free. You can click below, take you to the spreadsheet. It'll give you the percentages. It'll give you uh, the full breakdown to five week program. If it works the first time, run it again. Um, but even if you don't run it perpetually, the structure, the way that the volume and intensity moves over this short period of time should give you some good insight into uh, how a, a good quick peak is oriented, how you can get some quick adaptation over a couple weeks with some really aggressive jumps, and then how you can taper a little bit, back that volume off, and then get some quick recovery that leads to a new PR potentially. Quick overview of the program, 10 weeks on the order of 100 pounds for three different gentlemen. The program is a full upper lower body split, so you can click on the link and you can see the upper body dynamic alternates between push pressing and benching, the way that this alternates between squatting and deadlifting. For the lower body component though, it's what we're talking about today, there were two lower body days, so it was blended between squatting and deadlift. So you would do your squat and deadlift work on the same day, it would happen twice per week. Now this was a squat emphasis. Now all three of these guys very much wanted their deadlift higher. This was not, oh, I don't care about it. It's not part of my sport. This was very much, I want everything bigger, but we're going to focus on the squat right now. So I wanted to use that as not just the driver of squatting ability, 
but as a driver of general strength. And we could use just the right amount of pulling in order to get everything bigger. And that's exactly what happened. So squatting as a main lift was done two days. Now this is a really key thing. I don't mind generalized programs that have like the big four on a four day per week split. So a day for deads, a day for squats, overhead benching. That works well enough, but I really think there's a point where uh, if you want to see a big jump, if you're already a little developed or you're really having some, pro uh, some trouble with some lifts, that you need to focus. And in fact, my default is to kind of focus on one upper and one lower. That doesn't mean that's all you do. That just means that's the one that you're focusing your primary progression on. And that tends to work so much better than trying to cross your fingers and hope this one thing catches up while you're spreading your marbles across everything else. So there were three squat movements and three deadlift movements, but they're staggered. So with each day starting with a squat, all of the deadlift work would inevitably be fatigued. And where you squat as your main lift twice, you would only do a heavier deadlift once. And actually the heavier deadlift was really just a rep progression. There was no maxing, there was no top set. So there was no real heavy work. It was just a basic progression that was kind of gentle compared to everything else. So the idea is strength you got from the accessory movements, from the squatting, all of that was kind of getting funneled. So the deadlift more than anything was just practice to keep you sharp. And uh, the squatting, the main lift alternated. There was a volume day and an intensity day. So overall, the volume would start kind of low around three sets and then would jump up week three. Week three was an absolute mother. And then it would taper back down. So you feel in these first three weeks, not too bad. Okay, you're adapting to a little more volume. Then holy shit, the two weeks is really just so week three was recoverable. Because if you did that week one, it would absolutely wreck you. And that big overreach was followed by uh, backing off, immediately tapering back the volume. And notice that intensity, the weight, climbs up continuously just about through the whole thing. So at this point, after week three, you're really getting the effect of the volume dropping. So by the time you come in for that heaviest day, you are good to hit something big. In fact, if you took a deload after this and followed it up uh, with a, a true max, that would be a true contest peak. And most of you would see just a really big number on that day coming in completely refreshed instead of on the the back end of week four, which is like quite a bit of work. But the trend of bringing the volume down, this is how most tapers are going to look. This is how most short programs are going to look. Even if you look at something like uh, like Candido, you look at a, a short six or seven week program, you're going to see adapting a volume aggressively over a couple of weeks, followed by backing the shit off, getting the weight heavy, letting yourself recover by taking the volume down. And it just works really well. Guys, don't let the summer heat slow you down. I'm in South Texas right now. It's like 106 every single day. And Barbell Apparel's ultralight gear is keeping me cool during my workouts. They are here to keep your training on track as well with up to 30% off of their entire line of performance-driven clothing. Don't wait because this sale is ending soon. Their lightweight and durable fabrics are engineered to keep you cool and performing at your highest level. Just like Navy SEAL Chad Wright, who just ran a mind-blowing 250-mile race in Barbell's ultralight gear. Join Barbell's community of athletes who make no excuses and settle for nothing less than the best. Backed by a 365-day, no-questions-asked guarantee, Barbell's training gear and casual wear is built to power whatever your workouts, work days, and adventures demand. So this is the breakdown. Two days per week for the lower body across five weeks. So squatting, Let's start with the main movement done twice per week. It's alternating a volume week where we're getting repeating sets at the same weight. And that's practice, that's adapting to a little bit of volume. That's a nice, easy dial to turn. It's just to slowly add in a little bit more work. It's not so detrimental to do another set, to taper the weight up just a little bit. And then that would follow up with an intensity day. So that's where you hit a top set, something heavy. You push the weight a little bit, more strength specific adaptations, more aggressive. So that alternating between volume and intensity when you're uh, training the same thing a couple times in a week, it, it works out very well because neither one by itself is so rigorous that it's going to really hinder your recovery on the other day. And then we can see the pattern. So squatting goes from three by five to five by five, then starts dropping four by four, three by three. And the last week is one set of three or more with the final weight. And then the percentages just climb up evenly. Again, you can click the link below to see uh, the full breakdown of the spreadsheet with all the weights percentages. The secondary day, 
started with a max five, then we get heavier into a max three. And I like fives when you do top sets because there's a bit of wiggle room, especially with squatting. There's always a sense that if you have to, you can do a little bit more. You can just take one extra breath. You can psych up a little bit more. There's a little bit of elasticity with fives. It's one of the reasons like fives based linear progressions work so well. So what I did is I had you start with a five to get your toe in the water. By week three, volumes ticking up a little bit. You're not gonna hit a big number here more than likely just cause you're still in shock from the volume. By week three, you're gonna be starting to adapt to the volume, but it gets really high on some of these exercises. So you're gonna come in a little bit fatigued. So have you drop back to a top five, and then we go again into a three, volume starting to drop, a little bit more recovered, into a one rep max where volume is the lowest and you should be realizing all of the adaptations you made from everything so far. So this alternating of kicking the volume up and then dropping it and then progressing a top set in a pretty aggressive fashion I think worked very well. So just the fact of doing any squatting twice per week if you look at Roman, that by itself, I think solved his problem. I forced him because I wrote specifically for the front squats and the squats, ass to grass, no high squats, be very conservative with your weight selection, uh, round weight down, pick something you know you can dominate, don't leave any room for doubt, and just the accumulation of reps built so much confidence. In fact, he learned how to play into it. He learned how to use the depth to actually get his start more consistent. So that was a that was a big thing. For someone like uh, Edward, Edward really pushed the top sets. He was already a pretty conditioned strongman, and the real heavy attempts uh, week in, week out, with the sliding scale of reps, it was more sustainable. So this isn't the same as max one, max one, max one, or max three, max three, max three. Kind of getting a little heavier and then backing off a little bit and then running heavier again as the volume's dropping. A little bit of a more advanced maneuver, but that ebb and flow allows some intermittent recovery even though you're under this like shock and awe from all the work that's in here. I uh, put in a lot of emphasis on developmental movement because I saw this more as a developmental program. This was more oriented towards aggressively building the qualities needed to squat big more than it is a specific squat peak. Like I said, if you actually wanted this to peak to a one rep max, you would take another deload, max out after this. This by itself, there's so much volume, so much work. I was more focused on growth than specifically peaking for a one rep max. So front squats, one of my favorite developmental movements, especially if you're having trouble getting comfortable with depth, especially if you're having comfortable staying upright. I believe this helped out Kevin quite a bit because he's built like me, longer torso, shorter legs. So he needed to be strong enough and comfortable enough not to tip because as long as he could stay upright, he could just load into his legs like a leg press and it worked very well. So front squats I think were really beneficial for him, for Edward, strongman front squats are great for strongman, anything front loaded. Um, and again, Roman, his long legs, he hated front squats at first, but this actually forced him to figure out how to uh, get some ankle flexibility, how to load into his hips, how to squat, because he was a leggy lifter, how to not tip forward and then good morning the weight. So they all serve different purposes. And the beautiful thing is this, again, it paints with a broad brush. These are things that universally seem to be beneficial for most lifters. Uh, as far as the deadlift stuff goes, the uh, deads were just some token volume work, like building up over a couple weeks up to a five by five, nothing heavy, you're not breaking any blood vessels here, and then backing off into fours and threes, token practice work, and then again, heavy developmental. Just one deadlift day, good mornings and Romanian deadlifts were the other two hip hinge movements very easy to recover from relative to an actual deadlift from the ground. And it was easy to put this stuff in, especially for these crazy set and rep counts uh, because it complemented everything very nice. Three squatting movements, three deadlift movements, really heavy on the main squatting and then RDLs, good mornings, making up most of the hip hinging. You can go crazy with those, especially if you progress them. Most people don't. Most people do them tentatively. They're like, oh, I guess I gotta do it before I leave or my coach is gonna yell at me or I'm gonna feel guilty. It's like, chase them. They're great movements as long as you chase them. And then I finished up a little superset of uh, leg presses and ham curls here, lunges and back extensions here. I like high reps going from 15s down to 10, going from 12s down to eight. Um, same exact pattern, three, four, then five, then dropping volume as we get to the back end. Now, looking at this from afar, super duper glue heavy, super glue heavy. If you have any trouble getting your glutes to grow, if you do this and your glutes don't grow, 
seek medical help because everything squatting front squats are heavy on the glutes all the hip hinges are heavy on the glutes leg pressing is massive on the glutes uh, lunges huge big stretch as you step forward and drop that knee down so that's great for developing the glutes uh hamstring curl is probably the only thing here that doesn't really destroy the glutes so given the importance of something like strongman which is a big emphasis in our gym glute development something you can never really get enough of and that again i think tends to be a big thing that doesn't get uh, developed early enough in a lot of squatters because some people will develop glutes just from doing some token squatting early on some people i think need more aggressive intervention and that's where these variations come in now let's talk about this crazy volume because it, it, it gets crazy i didn't just dial it up a little bit i dialed it up a ton first of all Everything's starting out around three sets, and it should be three pretty easy sets. So the first week, three sets of everything, you should get in and out relatively quick. That's less than an hour to get through your leg day, and everything is relatively easy. I have percentages in, I believe, but um, RP comes out pretty low on everything, even as your gas, because you're not used to the work. Coming into week two, now you're a little used to the work. You're used to the arrangement, you got through both workouts. So you should be a little fatigued, but still a little bit more able, more capable than you were before. So now we're on five sets of five, going out five sets of 10 on front, holy hell. Are you crazy, Bromley? Five sets of 10 on fronts after you squat? Absolutely. RDLs four by six, don't skip those. Then you gotta come in a couple days later, hit a heavy top three of squats, geez, four by six on deads. It's so much work. And actually, it's not a lot of work. It's so much work if you've never done this before. So my recommendation is if you have no tolerance to volume whatsoever, is be very gentle with your weights. Maybe uh, change the, the working weights as the set goes on. So maybe easy set of 10, little challenging set of 10, and then an easy set of 10, you can increase weight, drop it back down. And then as you move on, let's say you got five sets of 10, more of those sets can be heavier, but they don't all have to be blood bursting. And then, eight by eight, six by five. People see that, they shit their pants, rightfully so. This is just about getting the work in. That's not about hitting your PR set of eight and then repeating it seven times. This is committing to hanging around, doing the work, even if this is RIR five on each one. I don't care. The fact that you showed up, you committed to eight sets, change the weight as needed set to set, and then go on to the next exercise. I would a lot, an hour and a half, maybe two hours for this day, and take your time long rest periods, take five minutes in between. Uh, make sure you're fresh, make sure cardio isn't holding you back. This week is an absolute motherfucker. And this top set of five, you're, you might not even beat your top set of five from week one. But check it out, going into the very next week, this is now a break. This represents your first break. You went from eight sets to four, holy crap. It's a vacation. And then going into that, you might be a little bit stronger for that top triple. Again, you come back even less work, and then you go into that new one rep max, and that's where you hit something big, wash, rinse, repeat. So that is my rationale. We got some broad strokes that tend to work for most people. We got a lot of practice with the lift, putting one lift on the front row, and then putting the secondary lift on the back burner, not trying to bring up everything aggressively all at once. We got generally good developmental movements that are just notorious for being effective. If you use them, if you progress them, we're not trying to go as heavy as F impossible every single day. We are intentionally adapting to volume as we steadily increase the intensity, as we steadily get a little used to heavier weight, but the volume is our focus early on and we don't start chasing big numbers till the end. And at the end of the day, if you can hang from this, if you eat, if you recover and you take your workout seriously, there's absolutely no reason why week five, you don't hit something that shocks you, that makes you wanna run through this again. So if you wanna see the percentages, if you wanna see the full breakdown along with the upper body component that treats push presses and benches in pretty much the same way, go ahead and click on the link below. So leave your questions in the comments, guys. Any questions you have as to why I wrote it out this way, if you have questions about execution um, based on specific circumstances, leave the question to the comments. Thanks so much for watching guys. Till next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.